This is just a small corner of the Tongass National Forest, a forest that covers most of southeast Alaska. Thankfully, it's still a largely intact and functioning ecosystem with abundant fish and wildlife. Aldo Leopold, the father of modern wildlife management, said, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Now, managing a national forest isn't exactly tinkering, but we are working hard to ensure that we maintain good habitat for all the cogs and wheels, including the remarkable species of fish and wildlife that live on the Tongass. The Tongass is one of the most unique places in the world. When I think about the Tongass and think about fish and wildlife in the Tongass, it's that connection between the ocean and the forests and the rivers that connect those together that really drive what we have up here that's a very unique ecosystem. It's unique in the world. Being near the ocean, it is a relatively moderate temperate climate which in turn drives this very abundant system and we have lush vegetation that vegetation is what creates the habitat for the many species that we have. As the Forest Services District Ranger in Yakutat, Trisha O'Connor has been responsible for fish and wildlife habitat. While she has a master's degree in resource management and wildlife, her connection to Alaska is as much genetic as it is academic. Her grandfather worked as a wildlife biologist when Alaska was still a territory in the 1940s. And her father was a star basketball player in Juneau. One of my uh, first experiences when I moved up here, I, I, I do fly fish, but I'm, I'm not that great. And um, I really wanted to, to learn how to catch a salmon on my, my fly rod. And I had tried quite a bit, but came down in the fall one evening, right before sunset. It was the type of evening where it, it didn't matter what I did with my fly rod, I could catch a coho salmon, every cast. And the first fish that I'd ever caught on my fly rod, my first salmon, as I pulled it in, a group of trumpeter swans flew over my head. And that was the moment I said, this is, this is such a special place. The Tongass is a special place to many others as well. Most who live here, or those who visit, are impressed by the abundance of fish and wildlife. We do not have a, a listed threatened or endangered species that inhabits the uplands of the Tongass. That, to me, that's a very telling story. That doesn't mean we, we don't have to be careful about what we do out there, though. Being careful means preserving existing fish and wildlife habitat, and in some cases, reclaiming them. Like the others working for the Forest Service on the Tongass, Tricia has been involved in both. We have, in the past, done quite a bit of things on the land that, that while we're good for, for one thing, may not have been the best thing for fish and wildlife. And so our charge now is, and, and we're, we're very um, serious about this, is looking at past effects of things like clear cuts, roads we put in, whether they were logging roads, roads for oil exploration, recreation roads, and making sure and ensuring that those features on the land are not having negative impacts on fish and wildlife. Restoration of habitat is taking place all across the Tongass. There are several examples in Trisha's Yakutat area. Well, we're standing on a logging road, and logging roads do affect fish and wildlife habitat, and in this case, they're affecting stream flow and how water gets to streams. The restoration in this case involved using heavy equipment to rough up a section of an old logging road. The result, in just two years, was a return to natural vegetation. A poorly designed road built years ago is causing a different kind of habitat problem. What we're seeing behind us here is an old road that was put in during the early 60s for oil exploration. 
It may look like a stream to you, but it's actually an old roadbed. The water has been diverted down the old roadbed and is taking away from high quality fisheries habitat. So we are in the midst of doing a project that would help restore those stream connections. Even though it might seem like a small project, it's one piece of the big picture of making sure that we have lots of salmon habitat forever. Yet another Yakutat restoration project came about because of the widespread use of off-road vehicles. And what's happened in the past is there's been quite a bit of unregulated use and people were able to drive wherever they wanted to and would drive through muskegs and through wetlands crossing streams. Through community cooperation, limits have been placed on where off-road vehicles may be operated. In addition, a short demonstration project used different materials to determine which would be best for future ATV trails. Other kinds of habitat protection have also taken place in Yakutat. In areas where there are stream crossings, we have actually gone in and put bridges, put crossings so that the public can cross safely and easily, and then the fish, uh, the fish habitat is not degraded by their, their continued crossing. Improving fish habitat is just one kind of restoration taking place on the Tongass. In Sitka, studies are being conducted on ways to improve tree growth after logging. We even age harvested this unit. The stems come back at such a great density and they grow so quickly that all the canopies interlock together and exclude the light from coming down to the forest floor. You can see on the, on the ground that, that there's very little vegetation. It's not much of a grocery store. We take out many of the, of the trees that are left in the stand, we, we thin them out, and then we, the canopy will allow more light to the forest floor, and the result is more robust forest floor vegetation, which is your grocery store for, for the deer. We have 435,000 acres of harvested land on the Tongass. We've already thinned about a third of those acres uh, to, to date, and we continue to have an aggressive thinning program. Although the Forest Service manages the land on the Tongass, that's only part of the habitat story. The fish and wildlife themselves are managed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. The two agencies work closely together. One example is at Pack Creek, a popular brown bear viewing area on Admiralty, an island famous for its bears. Today, Pat Creek is a 60,000 acre wildlife sanctuary where hunting is prohibited and bears are protected. Because of its popularity, viewing permits are required during summer months. Both Fish and Game and Forest Service employees are at the site throughout the summer to answer visitors' questions and prevent conflicts between people and bears. Most visitors to Alaska, the thing they want to see most often is a bear. And so having a place where there is a large abundance of bears and bears come into places where people can see them and see them easily really is a world-class resource. One of the ways to keep people interested in conservation and stewardship is knowing that they have some personal tie with the land and the resources out there. And, and wildlife really helps build that bridge. It's one piece of that connection with the natural world that I really think helps us as humanity maintain our connection with the natural world. And that is just so important for us to sustain what we have in the long run. Another example of cooperation between the Federal Forest Service and the State Department of Fish and Game involves salmon. We count sockeye, we count coho, uh, chum and pinks through the weir at least three or four times a day. And uh, all that data goes to, to Fish and Game and so they can get an accumulative number of how many fish are returning every year. Because I know that the information that we're getting out here is going to really allow the, the salmon fishery to be healthy and sustainable and to allow the Fish and Game to come up with a reasonable cutoff point, say, you know, this is how many you can catch, this is where the cutoff is, this is when you need to stop fishing. Seeing wildlife is one of the top reasons visitors give for choosing trips to southeast Alaska. 
But fish and wildlife on the Tongass provide more than just zoos without bars. They provide jobs and food for year-round residents. The Seatuck River near Yakutat is just one example. The same fish that sport fishermen upstream are fly fishing for, the same fish that, that the bears are eating, at the lower end of the Seatuck River, we have both commercial fishermen making a living off of that and uh, subsistence fishermen who are, who are feeding their families from the, from the same resource. The community of Yakutat has a very strong tie with that river because it provides so much for them in not only food but also sustenance and in a living. Now, the Tongass, I believe, really is a national treasure and a lot of it comes from having this world-class abundance, sheer abundance of wildlife and fish that not only can people come up here and see and see it in a beautiful setting, but they also have the ability, and we still have the ability to use fish and wildlife and do it in a way that's sustainable. As a teenager growing up in Michigan, I recall seeing a bald eagle for the very first time. It was circling in the sunlight against a gray October sky over northern Lake Huron. I was absolutely thrilled. Wildlife is sometimes taken for granted by those of us now living in southeast Alaska because it seems we have so much. But healthy wildlife populations require good habitat. As managers of the land that comprises most of that habitat, it's a responsibility we take very seriously. For the Tongass National Forest, I'm Pete Griffin.